as entrepreneurs, we're hearing all kinds of messaging on how we have to build deep relationships with our clients. We're hearing we've got to use big data. What is big data? How do you build these relationships? How do you create really powerful long-term relationships so that we recognize a lifetime client value? I mean, this is stuff that all of us are hearing about. And I got to tell you, it's unbelievably valuable when you do it. We are doing it. We're just learning it. And over the last few years, it's been huge impact on our businesses. And I want it to be on yours. And one of the top individuals in this whole arena is our special guest, Peter Fader. Peter is one of the top, top fellow entrepreneurs, but he's also a professor of marketing. So he's, he's one of those data geeks, number guys that actually likes creating results from a marketing perspective. And he's a, one of the co-directors. I'm looking over to the side to make sure I get the right title of Wharton Customer Analytics Initiative. So stay tuned. If you've ever wondered if you're using data right, you're building those right relationships to create tremendous value for your clients and for yourself, stay tuned. Ordinary success? No way. You want amazing, remarkable, exceptional breakthroughs. Dig deep, think bold, drive hard, watch yourself soar beyond your dreams. AESNation.com Peter, uh, I am so excited to have you join us. I mean, I've had the privilege of working with you a little bit. I'm going to have you come out and visit with my 200 plus uh, financial advisor mastermind group because I think your message, your book, all the research you're doing is so powerful. So I want to share you with our group here at AES Nation. And uh, so thank you, Peter, for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you, John, and, and glad to have a chance to share the message with uh, uh, everyone who follows you. Well, and it's, you know, it's, you know, we're, we're all out there blazing trails and uh, there's so, so many challenges when we hear about you know, we got to do this, we got to do that, and all this new technology stuff. You know, tell, tell me a little bit how, you know, you got to where you are. I want to get a little of the backstory so they get some framing. You know, my fellow entrepreneurs, whether they're watching it on the video podcast or the audio podcast, you know, where you're coming from so they understand your, you know, we all have a, a bias, but how you got to where you are that, you know, you've had the privilege of working with so many top firms and understanding what they're doing and sharing this experience. Well, I, I have been very lucky. Uh, it's it just uh, ironic because unlike uh, most of the, the folks you talk to who have just an incredible autobiography, I've been sitting in the same chair for 28 years doing pretty much the same thing. It's just that the world has changed in a way to make my work all of a sudden interesting. So the fact is I'm a number cruncher. I like uh, looking for patterns in data. I like predicting things. But I like to do it from a practical perspective, which means I want to use math that's easily accessible to most people, like Excel. Uh, and I want to be able to, uh, to answer real problems, not just nice theoretical ones. So whether it's been, I don't know, sports statistics or looking at uh, or playing dollar bill poker or looking for, for patterns and numbers there, or in particular, if, if we're looking at, at customer data to try to understand who are the right kinds of customers, who, sh who we should invest in, what we should expect out of them, uh, those kinds of questions. That's what I've been doing for three decades. But all of a sudden, uh, companies and entrepreneurs in particular really care about that stuff in a way that they never did before. Back to my three years of stat that I took. I was my undergraduate was in econometrics, and I'm going, you know, I'm never going to use this stuff. And I'm 58, and it took a while before I'm really using it heavy now. But uh, it's coming back. I got you know, a number of PhDs working with me who are trying to educate me for what I've forgotten. But the, just the magic of, you know, getting an understanding of clients. I mean, in the past, you know, this was something that marketing people did. And they kind of put their finger up in the air and test the winds and salespeople one-on-one. -on -one. All of a sudden now, the world's changed. Really, Peter, for guys like you that, you know, this massive information we're collecting on everyone, um, there's some tremendous insights. I mean, how, how are you seeing it? Because, you know, as fellow entrepreneurs, I can tell you, we hear big data and, we, you know, a lot of us shut off because, 
you know, it's too many numbers. We didn't pay that much attention in our math and stat classes. And it, it seems like a little weird, but boy, they're hearing enough stories of fellow entrepreneurs that are having some huge success using this. How, how, how are they, you know, how are you seeing entrepreneurs start putting it into place and what are they doing with it to get, you know, start moving along on this journey? Sure thing. Well, well, I want to take exception with one word that you used there, John, the word magic, because it's not magic. It's actually science. And a lot of the science is actually pretty understandable. In fact, a lot of it is really old. So a lot of what I do, here's the secret, is to take the kinds of things that direct marketers were doing to sell Ginsu knives on late night TV back in the 60s and 70s, and just take some of those very basic perspectives, frameworks, methods, and just update them to you know 50 years later. So so a lot of it is is kind of tried and true things that our forefathers in indirect marketing and other fields have done. It's just bringing it to new fields, to new data structures, to new kinds of managerial decisions. But it's distinctly not magic. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of firms see it that way that that it, it's it's magical or that it's some kind of black box that they can understand. I think it's really important for people to have at least some appreciation for the math. But we're not here to talk about the math per se, but to understand uh, how it's going to change the kinds of decisions that you'd be making if you didn't have access to that kind of data and models. Yeah, I haven't heard you say it that way before, and I, I totally agree. And it's, I, I've um, always been more in the financial services, marketing, and relationship management. And over the last several years, I've gotten really interested in the direct marketing community. And and the, the Ginzu knives and the late night infomercials, and they were one of the first to really collect data, but it was very hard to collect that data. Yeah, and and I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but I think you know, you're, you're bringing together you know, the, the power of the, the big computers and that bootstrapping direct marketing community and all of a sudden bringing it together and that is, you know, I'm gonna call it the magic bringing it together, it's not, it is a science. It's, I mean, I get, the amount of detail that I get in reports on, you know, where in the past on marketing, we'd try something uh, to make clients aware. Well, now there's no argument in our group anymore. It's like, okay, test it, see, you know, type thing. Too many people, too many companies are out there saying, oh, it's a whole new world. The old rules don't apply. Um, it, it seems like every 10 years there, there's, there's some kind of, you know, generational wave that we got to throw out the old and start with the new. Uh, and, and while that might be true with specifically the kinds of data that we have or the, or the words that we put around it, the basic patterns of how people behave, you know, how, how many of them are going to come in and try something, how many of them are going to uh, try it a second time or become loyal to it, those basic patterns are remarkably robust. They're, they're incredibly stable over time across geographies and across industries. So the real key here is to be open to, to learning from some of these other domains instead of saying, oh, ours is different or, oh, today is different. So if we can just uh, take the greatest hits from the, the, these other sectors or, or, or other uh, uh, time periods, um, there's a lot of collected wisdom already. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Peter, I, we talked uh, before in a, a previous conversation, I want to introduce you to Joe Polish who is one of those old, I mean, he's not an old guy, but an old time direct marketer. He's learned with some of the greatest guys like Dan Kennedy and others. And Joe, I'm part of his mastermind group. It's called Genius Network Mastermind. And, and one of the reasons I joined was I saw the power of living in Silicon Valley of using big data but you've got to use the tools of the old uh, way of doing it. It just now makes it easier to do. And, and really, that, that is, to me, revolutionized marketing you know, and building relationships and the value that can be created. Because it's, it's not only you know, influence is influence, but it's also that we can now get much deeper in the client and actually serve them better. That's exactly right. So, you know, uh, uh, while, while it does indeed revolutionize a, a lot of firms, there, there's a lot who have been doing this kind of thing. Uh, they, they recognize if you have a, a small number of clients, you already you have a pretty good sense about what they're likely to do and how they'll respond and which whose call you're going to take at 2 o'clock in the morning and who's going to have to wait until Monday to get the call back. So there's been a lot of 
kind of uh, of kind of heuristic understanding of, of this kind of customer centricity. Uh, again, especially if you have a, a relatively small number of customers. The, rev the revolutionary thing is to be able to take that understanding and figure out how to use data and technology to be able to scale it up, to be able to do that when you have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of customers, to be able to use uh, more technological solutions to be able to do the same kind of thing that you used to be able to do with small numbers. So, the, so some of the basic ideas of what we're trying to do aren't new. It's just that uh, people don't think about uh, that, that, that it's possible to do on that kind of scale. You know, Peter, who's, why don't we, um, you know, in, the book, in your book, and we'll go to your book in a little bit, but because I, I think it's a great book and everybody should read it. It's an easy read. It's not, you know, Peter is actually a nice guy. He doesn't throw all the numbers at us and everything. Not but, all the time. Yeah, not all the time. I mean, some of your students might be in trouble, but, you know, uh, but one of the things, Peter, that, jumped out at me and it's kind of the point you had because i'm so excited about this stuff because it quite honestly is fairly new to me even though i grew up in the financial services industry i worked with some of the largest companies and still do they're doing it but it's very isolated and it's not you know i think you and i would agree there's a lot of opportunity to do it more who's been doing it for a while that our fellow entrepreneurs would know about and and doing it well so I think that the, the classic textbook example would be Caesar's Entertainment. Uh, so when they were uh, in their previous incarnation as, as Harris, uh, it was very interesting that, that out of desperation, when Harris couldn't compete on an equal level with a lot of its deeper pocketed competitors, uh, they said, you know what? we got to do something that, that's different from the others. Let's turn to the data and let's build the loyalty program and let's get these deep insights and let's have the, the, the courage to be able to treat different customers differently on the basis of what we think they're going to be worth to us. Let's align them based on their value and then allocate accordingly instead of trying to roll out the red carpet to absolutely everybody because we can't tell the difference among them. So Harris rose to the top of, of their industry, uh, ended up buying Caesars Entertainment. So that, that's one classic textbook story. And there's a number of other companies like that, uh, uh, Tesco, the, the grocery retailer in the UK. And then, of course, a lot of e-commerce startups. One, one could argue that this is the whole basis of Amazon, for instance. So, so Jeff Bezos wasn't out there to sell books. He was out there and has been quoted as saying this, uh, using books just as a way to find people with a lot of disposable income and then sell them all kinds of stuff. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, and while some companies are, are, are kind of born into it, they're, they're born around the technology, it's much tougher for, for older, more established companies or older, more established industries to do this kind of pivot and to start saying, you know what, we now can treat our customers differently in a way that just uh, wasn't possible before. And you know what? We might be able to make more money by being able to sort those customers out and figure out who the more valuable ones and so on, rather than just trying to sell the same thing to as many people as possible. Yeah, and I want, I want to go to Caesars first, because uh, I, I want to dive a little deeper on this, because this is so important, important, Peter, that, you know, I mean, you know, we don't have to wait to have the heart attack like Caesars did or, you know, Harrods really did. I mean, that's what most of us are willing to change when we have the heart attack, and it's it's a little better to stay in shape and all that, and that's a different uh, <laughs> interview. But what, what we're looking at here is I want all of us as entrepreneurs to think about it. I mean, I, I, I got to tell you, I got honest, honestly, I became interested in this in the 2008-2009 downturn in the financial markets because our consulting, our coaching was to the big firms, and all of a sudden the big firms, you know, some weren't there, and then others – we're, in our case, we're, we're helping the top financial advisors with wealth management build great practices to serve their clients. Well, we've got a segment that's not for everybody. We've got to uh, work with them. And now we no longer had the firm's ability to do that. So we had a market direct. And that's where I really became interested in this whole data because the data is available. It's easy to sort through with today's technology. And one of the biggest mistakes I think all of us make is marketing. We used to shoot out this wide net to everyone. And, you know, you called it the red carpet of uh, Harris. But we do that to everyone and treat everyone equal. And, boy, they're not equal. I mean, the more we can understand that, um, I mean, you know, one of the things you write about in your book a lot is this client lifetime value. Let's, let's define that and, and tie that into that segmentation, you know, why it's so valuable. 
Uh, I, I'm happy to do so because that is really the, the the heart and soul of all this stuff. So so we're, we're looking at a particular customer, and, and I'm completely agnostic as to what we mean by customer. So it, it could be a client in a financial services setting. It could be someone uh, you know buying tickets to sporting events, but it also could be on a B2B side. So it could be a business that you see as, as the client or the mm -hmm. customer. And what we want to do is to project uh, how much revenue, how much profit we're going to get from that client in the future. And let's project it not just over the next quarter or the next year, but let's project it out as, as far as we can imagine, 10, 20 years, maybe further. Of course, recognizing the time value of money that those dollars we get 20 years from now aren't as aren't as worth as much to us as the dollars we get tomorrow, and so let's let's come up with really really accurate projections about what those those cash flows might look like, and let's use that as our basis to decide uh, who the best clients are, as opposed to historical profitability. Let's judge people on what we think they're going to be worth to us, as opposed to what they have been worth to us. Now, admittedly, those two are close to each other. If someone's been a good client in the past, they're probably going to be decent in the future. But it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. And if you're going to want to play this game the right way, you care more about the future than the past. I, what I've seen, I mean, in my own experience, and I, I really, this is so important. If you're not doing this now, you know, make sure, get Peter's book when I talk about it, spend some time with people that understand you know, the big buzzword for some of it, at least in the, the I'm involved with marketing automation, you know, you're getting the CRMs, the databases, and we're collecting the information and we're learning how to segment clients, have different or prospective clients first to create different campaigns and then follow them through kind of that whole customer client path, that whole lifetime experience and really make it valuable for them which then makes it valuable for us. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's one of those, uh, I'm a little embarrassed, Peter. It, it's so blindingly simple that, you know, so many of us as entrepreneurs have been slow to do it. We've been slugging it out the hard way, you know, just one client at a time, one relationship, one B, B2B type. And then now the world, I feel like I'm a kid in a candy store with all this data. I now can go, okay, this is who, we want to talk with. So let me put it in perspective, specifically for entrepreneurs. So, because because a lot of these ideas uh, we often uh, associate with with bigger companies that have the big elaborate CRM systems and the millions of customers to pick and choose. So, so how does it all fit for entrepreneurs? So, the thing is, most entrepreneurs, for good reason, are are, are inherently product centric. You know, they 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 come up with that great idea, a product or a service. And, it, and it's all hands on deck to figure out how to refine that product, how to get the message out, and how to get as many people as possible to buy it. That's the definition of, of product centricity. Uh, and, and, for, and that's totally understandable because, again, you, you're always going to start a business, or in most cases, um, with the product or the service. The issue is this. As you grow and then you have more and more customers and you start adding more products to the line and so on, at some point, you're going to stagnate. At some point, competition is going to catch up. Uh, at, at some point, you're going to have to say, you know what? It's not enough just to tweak this product-centric business model. We need something different. And it might be because of competition, as in the case of Harris, or, or a variety of other reasons. And at that point, people start picking up my book or other books on this basic topic and saying, we got to learn this customer centricity stuff. We got to learn how to value those customers and build, build our business around them. What I want for entrepreneurs is to recognize that while they're not going to be customer-centric right out of the gate, and that's understandable, that that pivot is going to take place. And, and I'm not saying they necessarily have to do it sooner rather than later, but I want them to, to be building, to, to sowing the seeds, building the infrastructure, having the, the mindset and the culture so when the time is right, it's as simple as, as kind of flipping a switch and saying, you know, we can use this other strategy now, or maybe we can use both strategies for, for different parts of the business. So it's just a recognition that for so many companies, it's that strategy, building the business around the customer, um, uh, often becomes uh, vital for the future. So let's figure it out, even when we're in a mode where we're not going to be necessarily doing that stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. I've had the, the privilege of firms that I've worked with and consulted with in the financial services side who have embraced this. And they, they started, you know, you, you don't have to do it all at once. You can't. I mean, it, there, there's a lot going on here. But by, you know, 
introducing the tools, getting clear on the lifetime value of the different types of clients that you have or customers that you have, it's pretty easy to pull this together and get it rolling. So, I mean, in our small company or mid-sized company, you know, in 18 months before we really were pretty fully executing and, we're, you know, every day there's a new lesson because the data keeps coming to us, the experiments and so on. But I see the big firms, you know, just taking a big, you know, a little piece and doing it. And I see for us as entrepreneurs, this can be, you know, you call in your book the strategic advantage. I mean, this is, I want everybody who's watching or listening to AES Nation to have an unfair competitive advantage. And uh, Peter, I got to say with all the interviews and so on that I've done, I think this is one of the biggest ones that we can do. Now, let me, I want to play a little segment here real quick. So when do you think this big breakthrough happened? You know, first personally, when you kind of got the aha moment, because, you know, I mean, my guess is a teenager, you didn't think about big data and big companies and client lifetime value. But, you know, when did this happen? How, how did it come that you go, geez, this is just amazing? I remember it so well. It was actually in, in uh, 1998 was, was my moment of epiphany because I was born and raised uh, on, on packaged goods data. So, so working with a lot of the CPG firms and then the, the, the data suppliers, the, the, the Nielsen's and the IRI's and helping them the build models and so on. But when that whole dot-com thing started, um, uh, just out of curiosity, back in 98, mm -hmm. I took a model that I was uh, using actually for a kid's juice drink. And just for fun, I applied it to a dot-com business just to see how the patterns would be different. You know that they had to be different. People buying music online is going to be very different than people buying kids' juice drinks in a grocery store. Well, it turned out that the patterns were identical. Again, if you look at the, 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 the number of people who adopt a product over time or the percent who come back and buy again and how often they do that and just what the overall sales curves look like, it's, it's remarkable how similar they were. So, so this was a moment of epiphany that to, to be able to kind of break down the walls that to say, oh, here is consumer packaged goods and oh, here is uh, online electronic commerce. And that made me curious to start to push the boundaries a little bit further. Like, can we dip our toes into financial services? Or what about pharmaceuticals? Or what about um, uh, media and entertainment? Uh, and and I haven't found the limits yet. I found, as I mentioned before, that the, the patterns are remarkably the same. Online, offline, U.S., China, big business, small business, B2B, B2C. Yet it, I find it just disheartening that so few companies are aware of these patterns and are, are willing or able to build business models that, that fully exploit them. That's why I wrote the book. Boy, I'll tell you, one of the things I've seen in the, the privilege of interviewing a lot of entrepreneurs and in my financial career, I've worked with entrepreneurs across every industry. And as I look at this, this is one of the few things that goes across every industry. Because whether you're B2B or B2C, you're working with people. <laughs> and you know, while we're all different, we're all a little weird, there's so many similarities of how we're influenced and the relationships we want to have with the, the people who are working with us, serving us, and so on. That well, I might clarify one thing on that, John, which is to say, in any one sector, with any one business, uh, the customers are actually vastly different from each other. There's going to mm -hmm. be the good customers, the not so good customers. The similarity that you're referring to is that that range of customers is pretty similar yes. from one industry to another. So the customers aren't similar, but the differences among the customers but are similar. The, the be behavioral issues that we have as individuals, whether I'm representing a big defense you know, contract or I'm buying a drink at Starbucks, we're still people, but you know, definitely very different. That's right. And that's why it, it bothers me when I see a lot of companies segmenting on the basis of, of demographics, saying men do this, women do that, Gen Xers do this, Gen Yers do that. The thing is, in any one of those demographic groups, there's still going to be a vast array of differences. And so, yeah, it might be true that the average woman buys a little bit more than the average man, but the spread around that is, is huge. So when it comes to segmenting customers, we want to do it on the basis of behavior. Because that's ultimately what we care most about. In the old days, we couldn't segment on behavior. We couldn't see the behavior at a granular level. But today, we can see it. 
Yet still, so many companies are locked into age and gender and whatever else. It's just not necessary or helpful anymore. Well, let, let me just bring it together too from, you know, just replay it because I, I think this is a critical point because in the past, what we would do is we segment but we would do it on the demographic and maybe a little psychographic stuff if we could get it. And we would market to those people and then serve them. And there would be wide, uh, you know, really, uh, the service offering would still be very big. Today with data, you know, Peter, if you're my client, I have all the data about that relationship. So I'm much more equipped. It's not you know, I can segment it down to that individual, um, not only demographic, psychographics, but the actions that they're taking. And we couldn't do that in the past, you know, on any scale. So that, that to me is one of the big wows. And the big wow comes back to the words that you said before, competitive advantage. So if we look at all the textbooks that were written in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, competitive advantage always arose through the products. Like, let's find ways that people can't imitate us or people can never catch up to us. It was always about building competitive advantage through product centricity. Like Michael Porter's work was, was all mm -hmm. around that kind of thing. And, and, and I'm not saying it's invalid, but today it's just much harder to build those, those product-based competitive advantages. But when it comes to our customers, when it comes to the, the data that you just described, no one can ever take that away from us. That will never, ever commoditize. The things that I know about my customers are unique to me. And so I really see that, 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 that understanding of customers at a granular level as, as a true source of competitive advantage. Not just a way just to sell more stuff, but to figure out who are the best customers well, and, and who are the not so good ones. Build yeah, and serve them it. well because with that information. It's not that we're manipulating clients or anything. It's our ability to serve the right clients that we can do profitably has never been better. And that's why I love this because I, I think one of the – Peter, I hadn't thought of this until you said it is, you know, I look at all products I don't, and I know the financial services industry well – they're commoditized. I mean, there's no way of really patenting anything. You know, if something comes out, it can be reinvented six months later, the whole thing. So the only thing that really is the value is a relationship. But in the past, it was having, you know, the salesperson having that relationship. Well, today, you know, that's still important, but the data is really the king part of this. I actually think the salesperson is more important than ever. Mm -hmm. I think that, that the, 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 the pointy end of, this, end of the spear on this stuff is changing the way that we manage and incent our salespeople. Because traditionally, the way most companies do it is sell a lot of stuff. If you can book enough business you know, this month, then we're going to give you the good parking space or whatever else. What I want to do is to change Salesforce uh, kind of accounting. Instead of how many orders did you book, it's how much did you lift the forward-looking lifetime value. So I want to encourage salespeople not just to, you know, oh, I got to do this before the deadline, but let's think long-term, let's build relationships. Maybe they're not going to buy a lot from us right now, but we're going to open the door to lots of sales that wouldn't have occurred otherwise. And but the nice thing about it is that this is what salespeople want. Salespeople don't want to be order takers. They want to build relationships. I mean, that's why God invented golf, after all, is to <laughs> let people build relationships. So if we can create structures that let us measure the amount of relationship building that has gone on, as measured by customer lifetime value, and then reward salespeople on that basis, I think we can just revolutionize the way yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, and I'd love to say I've already done that. I haven't. But what the salespeople initially, when I was putting it in place, they didn't like the idea, just pay us more. And now they love it because what it does is they, they recognize that the buying cycles are deeper in that people are doing more research before they have a conversation. And when they have the conversation, they may not get it unless they've interacted like this. And then when they do have the conversation, they have unbelievable data so they can have a rich conversation to serve that person. So we've seen... Not only are we having better conversations when we talk about the marketing sales uh, transfer, better conversations with the right people who they can serve really well. And that, that wouldn't have been possible without the data. That's right. And that right there, that is competitive advantage. And the hard part is, is getting 
uh, outsiders to appreciate it. So if you look at, at if, you know, a publicly traded company or, or even an entrepreneur and you have the VCs looking over your shoulder, uh, it's hard for them to fully appreciate and, and, and value a lot of that, that data-driven relationship building that you're doing. The standard metrics that we use to gauge the, the health of a firm are these short-term oriented metrics. So, so part of my job, part of our job, is, is an educational one, is to get people to actually really focus on metrics like CLV, not just in an operational way, but, but even to, to make sure that our stakeholders are aware of it and are holding us accountable on that basis as well. No, this is great. Let me go to another segment here. I want to ask you a question. Okay, you are a passionate guy. I'm a passionate guy. We both get excited about numbers and data. It's a little weird, but uh, we can make, impact so many lives. What are you working on now that you're most passionate about, Peter? A lot of it is this this educational idea. So, uh, so uh, you know, the, the the models themselves to predict CLV and this and that, that that's that's done. In fact, that's a, that's a good part about it. They're they're done. They're validated. The the math parts. Sure, I'm still tweaking a little bit. I'm still living the publish or perish professorial life, but I'm spending a lot of my time. One of the reasons why I'm having this conversation with you, John, is because I want to pay it forward. I want companies to have a real, real clarity on what this customer centricity stuff is and what it isn't, uh, the value that they can get from it. And, and one of the things that I've seen is that for, for companies to get real value from it, it's not just a matter of them doing the number crunching themselves, but if they themselves can pay it forward, if you can teach your clients how to be, how they can be customer centric with their own customers, then it's going to give them a better appreciation of why you're doing it for them. So a lot of it isn't just just giving people the the, the math and the methods, which again is is most of what my life is, but it's trying to way uh, trying to find ways to make this stuff just just really palatable to, to make it just just real easy to, for folks to understand it and and, and share it uh, and and again that's one of the reasons why as a real technical guy I kind of was willing to kind of uh, put put down the calculator uh, and write a very non-technical book in, in the hopes that it's it's going to uh, spread the gospel in a way that that others could continue uh, uh, moving it forward well, as well and, and really you know Peter we met from one of the the top financial advisors in the country who I have the privilege of working with. And he uh, called me up and he says, you got to meet Peter and emailed me you know, the link to get the, your book. And I read your book and I want to go to the segment. We call it the book of the day. And Peter, one of the things I normally do is I say, you know, what's your favorite book? And I'm not going to let you get off that easy and name someone else. I want you to tell me about your book and what's in and there. And I'm going to put up. Uh, uh, the screen on Amazon so everyone can get that. But, you know, tell me, you know, why you kind of gave me why you wrote it, but what's in there? What, you know, for entrepreneurs particularly, I mean, I think it's gold, but, you know, how, how do they get the gold out of this? So it's, it's, it's really three things. Number one, it's just bringing clarity to these two words, customer centricity. Unfortunately, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And for some, it means just being nice to everybody. You know, if, if, if any customer has a little hiccup there, well, then we're, we're not doing our job well. I don't believe that. I absolutely believe that there are some customers who are better than others, and we're going to be more responsive to them. And again, I, I, I look often at financial services as an area that's that's been willing to do that and has been rewarded as a result. And I want to see other industries take on those, those same kinds of practices. So that so that's number one. It's just bringing clarity to the basic definition. Uh, point number two, as I alluded to before. Is, is understanding this healthy balance between being product-centric and being customer-centric. For some firms, it means making a choice. We can only be one or the other. We can only have one strategy. We can only be thinking in one direction or hiring people with, with one kind of talent. For, for other companies, it means finding ways for the, those two to coexist with each other, that we're going to be really customer-centric with those customers who are really valuable, and for those other customers, we're going to just do them in great volume. That's going to be more product-centric. And third, as I mentioned briefly before, it's understanding the evolution that some firms go to from being product-centric towards customer-centric. And just what are the, the things you need to do? What are the metrics you need to start bringing in place? Just how do you start changing the culture of the organization to, to move in that kind of direction? So I, I, so I want to bring clarity and then offer some just initial advice. Uh, I'll be the first to admit it's not the end-all and be-all, just to get people to think about 
about some of those those, those differences, those dualities, and that uh, evolution from one kind of thinking no, to the th other. This is great, and, and and it doesn't stop there, Peter. I want to. I know on your website at the school, you've got other resources. What might entrepreneurs find there? So a, a lot of it is uh, the idea of, of harnessing that data. So when I'm talking to entrepreneurs, I'm always asking them three questions. So so if you had to to, to kind of rank, if you had to choose the, the, the best bits of behavioral data that you have about your clients, what would it be? In other words, what data are you most interested in, in tracking and, 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 and databasing and so on? That's number one. Number two, what derived measures would you create out of that observed data? And then number three, how is that going to change the way you make your decisions? Now, the right answer to question number two is going to be lifetime value. So we're going to look at the different behavioral data that we have, and then we're going to come up with these forward-looking projections and eventually use that to target customers, change the way we do the business, everything that we've covered. I want entrepreneurs to be really thoughtful about that. I want entrepreneurs to realize that maybe not tomorrow, but a year or two or five from now, we're going to be building our business around that stuff. So we might as well start figuring it out now. We might as well appreciate a little bit of the math. Uh, or at least the behavioral data that we need to have in place, as well as some of the systems, some of the, the, the early things that we'll do towards building a proper CRM system. Maybe starting with a simple loyalty program or other tactics like that. Uh, and so a lot of the research that I've done and a lot of the technical notes that I've written and a lot of the, the workshops that I run, all of these things are, are alluded to on, on my website, are just uh, you know holding people's hands, uh, giving them both the, the, the motivation to want to go in this direction, as well as some of the actual tools to help them take some of those first well, you, steps. You make it easier, Peter, and that, that's so invaluable. Let me give you the, the next segment. And this is the key takeaways. And let me play back the key takeaways that you know I really heard, I, I wrote down. I mean, uh, number one, I'm going to go competitive advantage, strategic advantage. You know, we work so hard to get this. And that shift from product to client or customer is huge. You know, the products are commoditized. And if your industry isn't, it's, it's weird that it's not yet, but it will be. And this is the only way that we can really differentiate ourselves. And, boy, get started now. I mean, as a fellow entrepreneur, I, I want you to have a big win. Peter wants you to have a big win. Everybody at AES Nation wants that. Second is the recognition. And this is one that's so easy for us to screw up is some clients are better than others. Some customers are better than others. And we should treat them that way as well as seek them. And then third, um, using this data to really mine for lifetime value is just such a big deal. And, and, and Peter, I, I want to thank you for sharing these insights. I mean, you know, we, you and I could spend, uh, you know, days together. We're going to get together next month and we're going to spend some good quality time and help uh, some of my fellow financial advisors. But this has been amazing. So thank you for sharing your insights. It is my pleasure, John. I want to give you credit, A-plus to you, for, for pulling those three takeaways because there's a lot of different messages in the stuff that I'm, that I'm writing about and doing in my research. Uh, and sometimes people pick up on some of the, the, the less impactful parts, but, but you hit the nail on the head, and I hope that, that all of your viewers and listeners will do so as well. Everybody out there, your clients, your customers, and all those future client and customers, they're counting on you to do this well. Don't let them down. We wish you the best of success. Ah!